Hi, I'm Michael Delamonica, and welcome to tonight's Flap and Focus, where we feature a candidate's forum for the 4th Worcester District seat, uh, which represents Leominster, Massachusetts, uh, you, uh, excuse me, Massachusetts House of Representatives. Have here Natalie Higgins, the incumbent. Hi, <coughs> excuse Michael. me. And uh, want to make the statement, we did invite uh, Richard Palmieri, uh, who is running against Ms. Higgins, and uh, he was invited on the forum to participate. Originally, his campaign accepted the invitation and confirmed uh, tonight's de uh, date as acceptable. On Monday afternoon, after I refused to provide him the debate questions in advance, Mr. Palmieri withdrew from the forum. I explained that I would not provide the questions in advance to either candidate because I did not want scripted answers. You, the voters, deserve to hear the candidates' honest, unscripted opinions and not a canned response from a campaign committee uh, or handlers. Uh, with that said, I will ask tonight all of the questions that I intended to ask both candidates. Uh, this was gonna, there was gonna be one segment where I asked one different question of Mr. Palmieri than Ms. Higgins. What I will do is ask both questions to Ms. Higgins and give her a chance to respond. But otherwise, uh, we will have all the same questions. So hopefully you'll get all the same information to allow you to uh, make uh, an informed decision. So again, Ms. Higgins, welcome. Thank you for having me. And uh, let's get right to it. So City of Leominster, and we were just saying off air, this is one of the few districts uh, in, the, in the State House, uh, you know, in, in the State House, the legislature, House of Representatives, where it is, it is just, your district is just the city of Leominster. No other parts mm -hmm. are like little towns, so you can focus yeah. just on the city of Leominster. So for the next two years, what do you see as the biggest challenge for the city of Leominster uh, that, where you can make a difference, and what do you specifically intend to do about it? Yeah, I think for a gateway city like Leominster, it's really jobs and the economy, and you know, our folks in our community are struggling a little bit more than the rest of the Commonwealth, and so we need to make sure that we're making sure we have good jobs, and that's through economic development bills like we just passed at the end of the session and also making sure that our education system is strong. I'm really proud of the fact that Leominster has a comprehensive high school, that you have both the academic side, the trade school, and then the Leominster Center for Excellence. We're setting up our kids in such a special way uh, that we need to continue to make sure that they have the tools and the resources to be able to set up our kids. I'm a proud uh, graduate of the Leominster Public School System. I'm the first in my family to go to college, uh, and I am so thankful for the launching pad that Leminster gave me, and I'm really worried that a new generation of kids aren't going to have the same shot that I had. And what are some things that you are proud to have done over the past legislative term to address some of those things that you've talked about, and what are some things you plan to do in the specific uh, things that you would like to see enacted or things that you would like to push or foster in the next two years? Yeah, in the last uh, term, I'm really proud of the work that we've been able to do through the budgets and through the economic development bill. In the fir my first budget, I was able to work with Senator Flanagan to get $85,000 for the Johnny Appleseed Trail Association. For folks who don't know what that is, that's our local tourism council. And that money had been nine seed by the governor in the previous year and put a lot of our small businesses kind of behind the eight ball because that, mo that money is used to attract uh, visitors and travelers to come and use their money in our community and, and buy things from our local small businesses and it's a huge boost to our economy. Uh, and also finding ways to invest in our schools and being a real outspoken advocate for uh, a reform to the Foundation Budget Review Commission. We almost got there this session. I think we had some really great uh, ground game and, and a starting point, but that bill ultimately didn't get finalized in the end of session and so we really need to make sure that gateway cities like Leominster with English language learners uh, and low-income students are getting the funding that they need. Uh, we can't just address the health care costs um, and the special ed needs. Those, all four of those pieces need to be addressed. Okay, and of course um, predominantly Democratic legislature, mm -hmm. and you work with the Republican governor, Charlie Baker. Yeah. Uh, why don't you give me a grade for Governor Baker? Uh, but Governor Baker's a popular governor, depending on what survey you look at nationally, either the most or one of the most popular governors in the country. Uh, and of course, you are on the opposing party, the Democratic Party versus the Republican Party. So what would you give a grade, what would your, what would your grade be for Charlie Baker, and explain the basis behind that grade? Yeah, I would, I would give Charlie Charlie Baker 
RSC. I think he's doing some good things, uh, but there's a whole lot more that we need, and we need someone who's going to be an advocate who's stepping up to make sure our public schools are funded and not looking to privatize our public schools into charter schools. We need to make sure Lemonster, a lot of Lemonster residents rely on public transportation, the commuter rail, and it's just not reliable or consistent to be able to get uh, folks to work and on time. And so that's putting a lot of workers at risk of losing their jobs. We need to make sure that we're taking a real look at the opioid crisis and making investments and and not sacrificing people's personal liberties at the same time that we're, we're addressing that crisis. But he is a popular governor and he, Absolutely. Very, he very well may be the governor um, in, in, in the next term. Uh, but so in a case where we're in central Massachusetts mm -hmm. and we have to compete with Eastern Massachusetts, yeah. Boston area for dollars. Right. Uh, more people out there. Sometimes we're we get neglected out here. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any specific plans, or, or what are some what are some things that you think you could do uh, to, to to reach out to you know, the, the the Republican administration to sure. to to bring attention to? I mean, that's one thing that you know certain other politicians in our area have tried to do. What are some ways in which you would do it as part of the opposing party? Yeah, so we need to work together. And I think that the Baker administration and the legislature work really well together. And there is a lot of bipartisan, almost every single bill that we pass is bipartisan and supported. And so I don't see Massachusetts politics as being hyper-partisan or that being an issue. And what we need to do in North Central Mass, I'm a community organizer by training, is work with our colleagues. We have a really strong knit uh, delegation in North Central Massachusetts, largely thanks to the work done by Sen former Senator Flanagan, uh, to make sure that we're working together. We're finding ways to pool these resources. We have two gateway cities in Lemonster and Fitchburg and Gardner, which is basically a gateway city, but too small to fit the qualification. I'm working really hard with Steve Hay and John Slotnick, and also with the Republicans in the region, with Kim Ferguson and Sheila Harrington, to make sure that we're looking at the whole region and pooling our voices so that N North Central Mass is really on the map, and I think we've been getting better and better at doing that. The one thing that we hear, and you mentioned Representative Hay, Representative Zlotnick, and I know both of them have heard this repeatedly from constituents, uh, probably one of the number one complaints out there in terms of uh, your voicing frustration, uh, three words, fix the roads. And uh, yeah. so, and it seems you know, I don't know why in the last few years it's it's it seemed worse than ever in terms of uh, you know road construction, potholes, roads not being tended to. Uh, we're going to talk about two somewhat, in in my view, outdated statutory formulas out there. The first one addressing roads, Chapter 90, uh, yeah. tra you know, transportation uh, you know, budget in terms of um, the gas tax, of course. Um, you know, is collected um, as, as revenue and distributed back, supposed to be distributed mm -hmm. back to cities and towns for road repairs. But uh, depending on the specific cost of doing business, mayors, uh, administrations in cities and towns complain that, look, the money we get back each year from the state it's, you know, we're responsible usually for 80, 90% of the roads in our municipality, but yet we only get enough money back to do like two miles of road a year, three miles of road a year, okay? What are some ways in which that statutory formula maybe can be looked at, addressed, um, modernized? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there's a few things. So we have a formula that right now is being funded kind of annually, and that gives us the opportunity. The plus side of that is it gives us the opportunity to put in extra money when we have it. But the problem is for particularly small communities, they can't budget for that. They have to save up a couple of years to be able to do these major projects. So Lemonster lucks out. But also this was one of the reasons why I was such a proponent of the fair share tax and making sure that those who make the most money in our communities pay the same rate as us. Like they shouldn't be getting a break. We should all be paying the same fair share and that should be going to things that are the public good. Roads, everyone benefits from this. Public education, everyone is benefiting from this. And we need to make sure that we have the resources to be able to do that. So just the way that we're looking at the foundation budget review for schools, I think we need to look at the Chapter 90 formula and make sure that it's really adequately addressing the needs of these communities. And as we're looking at ways to combat climate change and address a, gr a greener economy, 
look at things that aren't penalizing commuters out in, in Central and Western Mass who are driving to, to maybe better paying jobs in Boston. We need to make sure everyone is chipping into that system and not putting the extra burden on us who, who are living outside of the city. Okay, and you mentioned sort of in passing, you mentioned the, 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 the fair share, the fair share proposal in terms of basically raising taxes on, well, you, you describe it yeah, because sure. you know what, we hear, well, raising tax, you, you, you see flyers from, 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 from organizations, you know, you raise taxes 80% on this one or, or, mm -hmm. or this percent on that one. Uh, yeah. And then people like yourself come back and say, well, we're just raising taxes on the wealthy. Well, you know, what's the real answer? Just say it, you know, so that the voters yeah. in Lemonster can understand without the spin. Really, mm -hmm. what is this, what is the fair share proposal? Yeah, so the fair share proposal is really this idea that for, for you and I, um, the average wage earners in our community, we pay 10 to 11 percent of our income into taxes. For those who make over a million dollars, that's twenty thousand dollars a week that you take home. You're paying more like six to seven percent. So we're just trying to level the playing field, make sure that those folks who are earning the most, who are doing really well, who can support their families, are chipping in the same rate that we're ch chipping in and putting that into something that we benefit as a community as a whole, public education, public transportation. Public transportation is such a big thing because it's good local jobs. When we're fixing our roads, those are jobs that are staying right here in our community. Uh, and that is such an important thing to make sure that we continue to have job opportunities for, for everyone in our Commonwealth. Opponents would say, well, okay, now you're saying it's a millionaire's tax, but mm -hmm. maybe in a couple of years you like the idea and it'll be a $500,000 a year tax, or maybe it'll yeah. be a $100,000 sure. a year tax. And what's that? So what is your response to people who say, well, it's a slippery slope? Yeah, so this was a citizen-led petition. Uh, this was led by, Lemon, uh, by Massachusetts residents. One in 12 Massachusetts residents signed this ballot initiative. And it's a constitutional amendment. For us to change this again, this is why we're in such a, a pickle because it didn't end up on the ballot. We have another four-year process to be able to do this. It's really just kind of a red herring to say it's, a, it's gonna be a slippery slope because there's so much work that needs to go into this um, to be able to do it. It's not like we're just gonna decide at another time to have a graduated income tax. If we're gonna do that, we have to decide as a community, it has to go on the ballot and we all have to decide that together. Okay, and so speaking of you know, statutes and, and formulas that need some updating. The other thing I know, and uh, we have uh, we have a member of our Lemonster School Committee uh, back, backstage in the mm -hmm. green room is familiar with this as well. Chapter seventy yeah. uh, funding, yeah, the school funding, and um, we, you know, there's there's been a lot of criticism on really both sides of the aisle uh, mm -hmm. that this formula is outdated. That what happens is is that. You know, municipalities, a large part of a municipality's budget goes towards education. But even with all the money that a municipality spends on education, it is critical, the state funding that they get mm -hmm. in. And what's happened over the years, due to a variety of factors, is that so-called wealthier towns, well, towns wealthier than Lemonster, are getting basically a higher percentage or a higher, or, or doing better under the mm -hmm. this chapter 70 foot this 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 funding formula which is one reason yeah. uh, as to why and uh, you know that, that Lemonster uh, School Committee, the school budget in Lemonster, yeah. school budget in Fitchburg and Gardner to a certain extent as well, why they struggle each year to sort of uh, make sure that they, if to, to sort of uh, make ends meet in yeah. terms of the budget. So I'll ask you this, a couple of different things. What are some ways in which that formula can be updated? Mm -hmm. What are some ways in which you would seek over the next two years to update that formula? And then to what extent is it also a spending problem on the local level yeah. that we need to address? So in other words, um, what are some ways, in your opinion, I understand you don't have a direct impact on the local decisions, but you certainly have some influence as a legislator mm -hmm. in terms of, well, what should the municipalities be doing to do their share, and what yeah. should the state be doing to do their share? And in terms of the state, what are some things that you can do to, uh, to, to make that a, a reality, some of the, some of the updates to those, those things? Yeah, great question. So I, I've mentioned it a couple of times, the Foundation Budget Review Commission, so a couple of times since the the original Chapter 70 formula was set 
in 1993. I don't wanna, I'll date myself, I was five. So it's really out of date. Uh, I was six, <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> so we really need to look at this. And the problem has been kind of consistently is as we go a decade out, two decades out, it gets more and more expensive to fix it. So some of the things that were included in the formula that are just broken are, are special ed costs. We didn't know that we were gonna have so many kids with special needs that absolutely should be getting accommodations, but that costs money. Healthcare, our healthcare costs have gone up astronomically and, and we can hopefully talk a little bit more about other bigger ideas of how do we bring in healthcare costs and bring them down in Massachusetts. One of the things that I think we need to look at is a public option or a single payer system because folks shouldn't be profiting on our health or lack of health. Uh, English language learners. We did some things to kind of level the playing field this past session. We had done some reforms that were well intentioned, but it had this idea that every English language learner is gonna need a year to master English. Well, for a five or a six year old, yeah, it might only take a year, but for a 15 year old, it might take longer. They might need some more help learning a new language. Uh, and for, um, the fourth one is uh, for low-income students, so gateway cities, cities that don't have the tax base like Lemonster, like Fitchburg, we need to be able to give them some extra help. And this is really about reforming this formula, not just to be about a quality of funding, but equity of funding, because there are districts that have a lot and are spending well over 20% above the recommended funding for our schools. Uh, and cities like Lemonster that are hovering around uh, the, the kind of net school spending. And so I do think that that's also a priority at the local level and I'm so proud of the work that our school committee has done in this budget crisis and our superintendents and our mayor to figure out how do you have that conversation um, and where does that money need to come from? And families are struggling in Lemonster. We need to find a fairer way and the state needs to kick in more money but in the meantime, how do we prioritize the funding to make sure our teachers have what they need, our students have what they need and they can excel in school. Okay, so this is the question I was going to ask Mr. Palmieri, and then uh, that was the specific question to him. I'll ask it to you, mm -hmm. and I will also, I also ask the question I was going to ask specific to you, sure. to you so as well. So you can do your best in terms of answering uh, yeah. this. Uh, on the federal level, mm -hmm. okay, uh, with, the, with the Trump administration appointing Supreme Court justices who are strict constructionists as to the Constitution, uh, who perhaps with a conservative majority in the Supreme Court are going to allow states to to make to either prohibit or put limitations on things that were otherwise completely constitutionally protected, like uh, abortion within uh, within the first trimester or gay marriage. Those items are basically cannot be, uh, with, with some small exceptions, cannot be disturbed by states because of existing Supreme Court rulings. If the Supreme Court were to rule that states could now make their own rules on those things in terms of gay marriage, in terms of either restricting or prohibiting abortion, uh, how, would, how would you uh, come down on, if, if you had the opportunity, if a proposal was done to limit or restrict uh, or to, or to either of those items, what side would you come down on? Yeah, we're already taking steps to make sure that the protections that are already in place remain in place in Massachusetts. So for a woman's reproductive health care access, and that's not just for abortion, but for all other forms of, of health care access that are so vital, we want to make sure we pass the access bill, which makes sure it closes um, it makes sure that women have access to birth control. We passed the patch bill this session, which closes a loophole in our HIPAA reporting where uh, folks could find out kind of what kind of healthcare access you were getting based on being the, the primary holder of the insurance policy, which doesn't exist in any other situation. We wanted to make sure that that was closed. And then right at the end of the session, we repealed the archaic laws that dealt with a lot of uh, reproductive health choices to make sure that if the federal protections fall away, Massachusetts is still protected. And I hope that folks do a lot of research. Uh, I'm gonna to continue to stand up for LGBTQ rights. I want Massachusetts to continue to take the lead to be inclusive and safe and welcoming for everyone. Um, and we have a ballot question coming up uh, that is seeking to actually, for the first time, take people's rights away. Um, it's question number three, and it's seeking to take away transgender public accommodations rights. Right now, folks are protected, but if this falls away, that means a Starbucks worker 
is protected based on their gender identity, but a customer isn't. A student who's in school is protected, but if they go on a field trip to a museum, they might not be protected, and that is unacceptable. Discrimination has no place in Massachusetts. And then the question that was going to be specifically for you, um, and Mr. Palmieri would have had a chance to rebut it, uh, you would have had a chance to rebut the uh, mm -hmm. answer to that question, is, is this. This is a, Lemonster, if you, if you look at the demographic in Lemonster, a lot of independents, a mm -hmm. lot of good share of Democrats, uh, but it's what I like to describe as sort of JFK Democrats, conservative Democrats, uh, people who have a conservative streak to them, okay, uh, in, in terms of Levenster. We do have a conservative streak. Uh, there, one criticism of you and of some of the things that, that you are prioritizing is that you are, have progressive ideals. And that, and that what your opponents are saying is that you are not in step necessarily with uh, the more blue collar conservative Lemonster uh, you know, voters in terms of uh, a couple specific example, gun rights, because uh, you, know, you supported, you voted for Lemonster's version of the red, so-called red flag bill mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, uh, the, the sanctuary city, sanctuary state debate, and in terms of the whole, well, when you were first in the, you know, the headlines that were made, the whole pay raise mm -hmm. uh, vote. So yeah. it, here's your chance to sort of explain to the voters of Lemonster, look, uh, you know, what, what, what is your justification for what is seen by many as mm -hmm. progressive views on gun rights, pay yeah. raises, uh, sanctuary city, sanctuary state? Yeah. So. Uh, that's a lot, so I hope you yeah. give me a little bit to unpack that. So, I've been born and raised in, in Lemonster. I own my great-grandparents' house. My roots are here. I love this community, and I grew up in a working-class family. My dad didn't finish high school. He worked his butt off to make sure that me and my brother had a better shot than he did. And he's a really successful small business owner now, and those stories often don't happen anymore. And I want to make sure that folks can work their butts off and succeed. And that's why I support a lot of the policies that I support. And I don't think that I'm particularly progressive or radical. All of my experiences are based in growing up in a working class family who felt like government wasn't working for them. And that's why I was so excited to run for state representative in 2016, because Lemonster's really spoiled, and I feel really spoiled, that we get one state rep for our whole city. That's a really unique position to be in um, and a really unique place to have an advocate. And I've been focused on my first term in meeting Lemonster residents where they're at, having weekly office hours both at night after hours from 5.30 to 7 at the Lemonster Public Library and early morning from 7 to 8 a.m. Uh, at the Lemonster High School every single week because I want to make sure Lemonster residents, no matter what your work schedule, have access to me. And it's why I show up to things like Flap TV and participate in social media. Uh, and last summer did community forums on issues that I was hearing the most about from constituents. Education, transportation, the economy, and health care. I am here to listen to you and I can only be as good of an advocate for Lemonster as you are reaching out to me and I'm so thankful for everyone who shows up to talk to some of those issues that you brought up. The extreme risk protective order. I serve on the mental health, substance use, and recovery committee and I'm really thrilled to be able to continue the work that Senator Flanagan had done. We served on the committee together before she uh, stepped down to, to take over on the Cannabis Control Commission. And we've talked, I go to the Sportsman's Club, it has a special place in my heart, one it's right up the street from me, but my grandfather was their president when I was a kid. My parents actually met there. I wouldn't exist without the Lemonster Sportsman's Club. Um, and for a lot of gun owners, the status quo of, of having unilateral authority in the police chiefs, if someone has a mental health crisis, was really problematic and this extreme risk protective order really worked to make sure that it understood that a mental health crisis can be acute in time and it can be temporary and you can be a safe and responsible gun owner later on after you get the mental, mental health care that you need. And so I actually, in talking to a lot of gun owners, they were excited about actually having standards and knowing and that there was a judicial review process and that it can be uh, appealed uh, and then um, Safe Communities was yeah, that yeah, one? Yeah. <laughs> Safe Communities Act. There's very little that we can do uh, at 
the, the state level around immigration policy that's that's mostly a federal issue and just so the record is clear there's no bill in the massachusetts legislature that's going to make us a sanctuary state or lemonster sanctuary city i actually think it's unfair for a community to hold themselves out as a sanctuary i don't think that that's a good thing to do given that the federal government sets immigration policy we shouldn't be promising folks that we can keep them safe from deportation. That's not fair to them because that's not the policies that we set. What I can say I stand for and what the Safe Communities Act would do was make it very clear that Massachusetts would not participate in a uh, religious registry or a national origin registry. Make it really clear that if the federal government wants our local law enforcement to do immigration work, that they gotta pay them for that work. Our law enforcement are already overburdened by uh, the opioid crisis. We can't add another thing to their plates without making sure that they have the funding to do that. And I'm really thankful for FLAP for having an In Focus episode with Fitchburg Chief, Poli Chief of Police Martineau uh, to talk about the Safe Communities Act, the COPS Act, and all of the layers of this discussion. Uh, that it's, it's not black and white. There are lots of layers of government, and I'm happy to have anyone who, who wants more information on what the bill does to walk through the bill with me. I'm happy to do that, and I continue to do that. But I want to be clear. We're not making Massachusetts a sanctuary state. That's not happening. Uh, and I 20 like seconds on pay raises. <laughs> oh yeah, pay raises. Uh, so this is really about equity. The, I wish this was not my first vote. Folks who talked to me about it, I was pretty angry that this was gonna be my first vote. I wish my predecessors had, had fixed it a long time ago, but these uh, legislative stipends hadn't been fixed um, since the 80s for the speaker and the, and the Senate president and since the 90s um, for everyone else. And so some folks got a vice chair and didn't get a stipend. But if you got a vice chair of another committee, you did. So this was all restructuring. Before I voted on it, I made sure that it wasn't gonna cost taxpayers any more money. It was rolled into the budget that we already have. Um, and we haven't increased that line item uh, even in the next budget session. Uh, and it's really about fairness. If we're gonna have folks who represent the community and who look like our communities and our single parents from working class families, we gotta make sure that folks are being paid adequately to do this job because it is a full-time job and it should be treated as such. Natalie Higgins, uh, thank you very much for, for doing this. Uh, very informative, and uh, thank you for coming on. And what's important, uh, folks, is that uh, we don't have a primary for this particular race, so you just you go out and uh, vote in November and uh, get yourself informed. Thanks for joining us. Um, I don't know, do we, do we have time, folks, for, for Natalie to just uh, give a couple closing segments? We got, we have, we have, yep, okay. A few minutes? Yep, yep, so if you want to give a yeah, closing. Sure. Uh, Statement? No, I want to thank everyone in Lemonster who supported my original candidacy. It has been an honor and a privilege to be your state representative for the first uh, two years. I would love to meet you if I haven't met you yet. I am prided myself on being accessible and available to Lemonster residents. That's why I'm here today. Even when my opponent uh, decided not to join us, I wanted to make sure that you knew that I valued uh, your perspective and that you knew where I stood on the issues. And I wanna make sure that there has been a lot of dark money in my uh, race already, which is uh, disappointing and frustrating. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that you heard directly from me uh, what my stances are and to set the record straight. And I'm so thankful for everyone who tuned in and are watching this. And if you want to get in touch with me, again, my office hours are Monday nights, 5.30 to 7 at the Lemonster Public Library and Friday morning, 7 to 8 a.m. at the Lemonster High School. And you can always give me a call on my cell phone, 978-602-3772. Thanks so much. Again, thank you, Natalie Higgins, and thank you, uh, everyone who uh, tuned in tonight. Thanks. Bye-bye.